Welcome to today's local government education program provided by the University of Illinois Extension, the Prairie Rivers Network, and Just Transition Fund. My name is Nancy Wadrago. I'm a com community and economic development specialist for U of I Extension, and I have with me Amanda Pankow from the Prairie R Rivers Network and Emily Rhodes from the Just Transition Fund. Uh, this is the, I think, the fourth um, or fifth of uh, webinar we've done. Uh, we continue to do these webinars to try to uh, do outreach with the different uh, communities across the state that are transitioning from uh, coal. Um, and so we're just happy to continue this outreach uh, with this very important topic today. Uh, we're going to cover Illinois abandoned mine land reclamation and our presenters will share the history and importance of this program and they're going to share some tools and resources with you that you can use to safely repurpose your closed mining areas. And so I really want to thank you all uh, presenters and participants alike for being here with us today and without further comment I'll hand it over to you Amanda. Thank you Nancy and thank you so much um, for everyone for joining today. I'm excited about today's topic, abandoned mine land reclamation in Illinois. Um, you heard a bit about that from Nancy already, but I just wanted to start off by saying one of the reasons why this topic is so timely right now in the fall of 2021 um, is that the fee that funds abandoned mine land reclamation expired just three weeks ago on September 30th. So in addition to just getting a background and overview of, of abandoned mine land reclamation in Illinois, we're also going to talk about what federal proposals exist to keep this program going and to ensure its success in the future. So Nancy already covered this also. Um, your, um, the webinar today was brought to you by University of Illinois Extension, as well as Just Transition Fund and my organization, Prairie Rivers Network. And I've shared our contact information here on this slide. Um, so we have several presenters today, so I just wanted to introduce them and share today's agenda. Um, so I will kick off the program with a brief history of coal mining and abandoned mine lands. Then I'll hand it to Rita Lee, who is the supervisor of the Illinois Department of Natural Resources Office of Mines and Minerals abandoned mine lands program. So she's gonna dive deeper into Illinois' program and what these sites look like in Illinois and how they manage the Illinois program. Um, next, we'll hear from Eric Dixon, who is a senior researcher with the Ohio River Valley Institute. So Eric's gonna widen our scope a little bit, looking at this program, the, the Abandoned Mindlands program nationwide, what the program needs to be successful in the future, and also some recent analysis on job creation opportunities. Um, and he'll also begin discussion of what proposals are in front of Congress to reauthorize and even give this program a boost. Then we'll hear from Dana Kuhnlein, which, and she is a reclaim coordinator with Appalachian Voices. So Dana is gonna dive in a little deeper on the status of those potential federal actions that relate to abandoned mine lands and other coal related issues. Then finally, um, we're gonna hear from Karen Peterson, climate change project manager with the Nature Conservancy. And she's going to briefly discuss a brand new effort from the Nature Conservancy mm -hmm. in Illinois that's going to examine the potential of abandoned mine lands and other brown fields for solar development. Um, as Nancy already mentioned, we'll have a question and answer session at the end, moderated by Extension's Lisa Merrifield and um, Just Transition Fund's Emily Rhodes. So without further ado, we'll get going here. Um, so just a brief background about coal mining in Illinois. The Illinois Coal Basin refers to a region of coal that covers about 65% of Illinois and extends into portions of southwestern Indiana and western Kentucky. Uh, amazingly, I think this is a statistic that not many Illinoisans probably know that mining has occurred in 76 of our 102 counties. So the a discovery of coal in Illinois dates back to the late 1600s. It was discovered in outcroppings on the Illinois River, but the commercial mining of coal didn't really begin in Illinois until the early 1800s. Um, and it really didn't pick up till the late 1800s, early 1900s. And that was due to increased demand, railroad expansion, as well as the invention of the steam shovel that really boosted production and interestingly, Illinois coal industry actually hit its peak in 1918 with an annual production of 90 million tons that year, or around 90 million tons. 
So most of this early commercial coal mining was primarily underground mining, but by about the 1960s, more than half of coal mined um, in the state was surface mined. Um, and that's important relating to what abandoned mine lands look like if they were underground mined or surface mined. So today, Illinois is mining an average of 43 million tons a year. That's looking at the last five years. 2020 was low due to um, the pandemic. So I took the average there. And most of this is today is underground mines. And Illinois is fourth largest coal producing state in the nation. Another I think, interesting fact that most Illinoisans probably don't know. So almost two centuries of coal mining occurred in Illinois before the passage of any laws to regulate the environmental impacts of the industry. And by the late 1970s, over 200,000 acres of Illinois land had been affected by surface and underground mining. Nationwide, that number was over a million acres. So in response to these environmental problems, as well as growing health and safety concerns, Congress passed the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act of 1977. You'll often hear this law called by its acronym SMACRA. So SMACRA created two programs, one to regulate the operation and reclamation of new and active mines. Then the other program that we're gonna be talking about today was created to deal with lands that were mined and abandoned prior to the passage of the law. So these unreclaimed lands that were mined prior to 1977 are defined as abandoned mine lands. We often also hear these called pre-law lands or AML lands. So in a moment, we're gonna hear more from Rita about what these sites look like in Illinois. Um, but in general, they include not just impacts to the land, they include impacts to water, to air, and um, also to safety. So the, the AML program under SMACRA established a fee on coal production to fund the cleanup and reclamation of abandoned mine lands. This fee is collected by um, OSMRE, the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement. And it's a fee on every ton of coal mined. And then it's distributed to the states and tribes that are running their AML programs. So the collection of this fee, as I've already mentioned, it continued from 1977 until three weeks ago when its collection expired on September 30th, 2021. Um, so while the topic of abandoned mine lands is important each and every day, it's especially relevant and important today. Um, and we're gonna hear more from my fellow presenters now about the current status of, and importance of this program in Illinois and then also diving in on why and how we can reauthorize the collection of the fee, as well as make further investments in reclaiming abandoned mine lands and supporting coal communities and workers. So with that, I'm going to hand screen sharing ability to Rita Lee with the Office of Mines and Minerals. And while Rita is getting her slides together, I just want to thank you again, Amanda, for that introduction. I want to remind participants that at any time you should put questions um, in the chat uh, as you think of them so that um, when we get to the discussion portion of today's program, um, your question will, will be there ready for us to pose to the presenters. Thank you. And Rita, um, let me see if you've got your mic queued up and ready. Um, you have a, yeah, it looks like you're muted. Uh, there you go. Okay. Sorry. Not oh, very good on these. <laughs> oh, that's all right. And your slide looks great. Okay. Um, so today I'm talking a little bit about Illinois' Abandoned Mine Land Reclamation Program. And uh, on the slide is several different varieties of abandoned mine sites. Uh, down in the lower corner is probably what most people think of, uh, mine refuse, barren mine refuse, no 
uh, no cover, you know, no, no, no reclamation that would be in today's current standards for coal mining. We also see a lot of uh, facilities that are left from the coal mines. Um, and then um, our, the upper right hand corner is an emergency situation where very suddenly the ground gave way because it was uh, some subsidence, either room or pillar mining or an air shaft or something. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit, gonna show you what sites we currently are reclaiming to give you an idea of what kind of things we reclaim. We're going to uh, tell you how we prioritize sites in the state of Illinois. Um, I'm gonna show you a mind viewer program that you can look to see if you see a site and you wanna know if it's a uh, part of our program. Um, we'll let you, I'll show you how to identify that and then just give you a little bit of current information on the current program. So uh, jumping right in, I'm going to uh, show you some of the sites that we're currently working on. Um, Bluebird Pico is by large the farthest, largest one we're working on currently. Uh, we have a reclamation cost, construction cost of about 4.8 million. We're going to reclaim about 180 acres. And uh, you can see there's a lot of barren mine waste that uh, we will consolidate and then cover with good clay and get it seeded. Um, we're also going to work on some of the water in the site. Um, the upper left picture is, um, is, is, an, is our S and mine drainage that we're seeing coming out. Um, so we have very low pH waters and coming minerals coming out of the, the waste, the mine waste um, contributes to this low pH. And so we'll be incorporating lime to try to neutralize what the um, seepage coming off this mine waste and try to clean up the waters. And um, unfortunately, we also have some what we call uh, clogged streams, clogged stream land. So because this was barren for so long, some of it has run down into the streams downstream of the site. And so we will uh, clean those up and get them back to a more functioning stream. Um, another one of our larger project site is Forsyth Energy near Cambria. It is uh, going to reclaim about 77 acres for almost $2 million. Um, what we were seeing is this is uh, more of a surface mining site and they mined up to the roads. So you can see um, that there's not much land between the road and the water impoundments. And so we want to make that safer by filling next to the road and moving the ponds over. And uh, this middle picture here, it's really hard to see, but if the dark area there is all water. So it's not just this pond, we have drainage ways all the way down. And so uh, the upper, upper right photo is kind of showing you as we've started construction, going in and clearing and regrading. Um, you can see this part here is where we will get the fill to, to make a safer roadway. And the water then will be moved over where this excavation occurs. Um, one of the big reasons why this project jumped to the top of the stack was that this road now leads to a winery and potentially to a casino. So what used to be a small little township road is gonna see a lot more traffic. And so we wanted to make this a safer roadway. And one of the things I want to point out to you with this slide is that uh, we're working on private land. So people have gone and bought this surface mined land and they like it. They like the way that it is. So on the north side of the road, these people didn't want us filling in their pond. So the only thing we can do here is put up um, barriers, um, draw on a blank, um, to keep people out. So we're really not reclaiming that side because the landowner wasn't wanting us to mess with their property. So, um, so we'll just put up road barriers to keep, keep, hopefully keep people out of this water. One of the other things we're doing on this site uh, further south is that we are um, removing the surfaced what we see on the surface of the slurry and in the mine refuse. And like I said, we'll consolidate that 
and then cover it with about three feet of clay to make sure that, uh, that it won't erode. And then we'll uh, put grass over it and to stabilize it. Um, another of our projects is Kikuku Embankments. It's about 1.5 million. This is a roadway into the state park, which has a lot of campers coming back and forth to the campground. Um, it's on the Vermilion River, our only natural scenic river. So this is a high, high, high use site. And so uh, the cross section here is showing you that, um, that the roadway was pretty steep. It dropped off on both sides into water. So there was nowhere if someone had a flat tire, something happened, they needed to pull over. There was nowhere to pull over. So we went, what we're doing here is building up the land again in the water we're putting riprap under the water and then we come and put fill dirt on top of it and make a nice wide area next adjacent to the road. So if something happens, someone has somewhere to pull over and they won't be falling into the waters. We call these dangerous piles and embankments. So this roadway was probably created during the mining times for them to get access back and forth. So this isn't really natural ground that we're working on. This was created lands. Um, and again, another dangerous pile in embankments. We're seeing a lot of these. Um, they mined all the way up to the road and then kind of left it very steep. So this is one of our smaller projects. It has two different sites, Little John and Corn Crib, uh, about a half a million dollars. Um, we were contacted by the Township Road Commissioner because a car went off the road in the winter. And thankfully they stopped on the embankment. They did not go down to the water, but so that's what we're trying to prevent here. Give them opportunity to, you know, have some clear land adjacent to the road to pull over if something were to happen. Um, Old Sowerby, this is one of our top priorities and we call these vertical openings. So these are either air shafts or um, other kinds of portals to the old you know, underground mines and, uh, or the mine themselves will um, subside. You know, the room of pillars will kind of shift and, and so we get subsidence or a vertical opening. And we uh, will go in and excavate to stable soil, do some filling. Sometimes we'll put a uh, flowable concrete in to try to ensure that this does not open again. Um, we also on this side in the middle picture had some barren refuse. Uh, so, you know, this old coal refuse is not very conducive to, to uh, growing grass and stabilizing it, you know, making high erosion areas. So we uh, will go in and bring consolidate it, bring cover in and uh, plant it. Um, and then Peabody 18 is uh, about a five acre reclamation site. Um, this one really sticks with me because it's my worst fear, um, mine fires. So what had happened about 10 years ago was the GOM, the refuse on the surface, uh, caught fire. And um, so it took us a while to get it put out. But once we did, then we found some, um, some slurry that we wanted to clean up afterwards and what we call a hazardous facility or equipment, like the picture, you know, of the of the upright, this was more of an impoundment structure, um, but we'll go in and remove it. It has no purpose anymore and we don't want anybody to get hurt on it. So we'll go in and remove it and clean up the slurry. Um, and then this is uh, one, another one of our uh, sites that we see very commonly in Illinois and we call it a high wall, a dangerous high wall. And so in the picture on the left, it's, it's not vertical, but it's a very steep slope so that if someone were riding their four-wheeler, which they do on this site, even though it's private property, they come and they ride their four-wheelers. And if they would go off the edge of this, they would, you know, there's nothing to stop them. They would have gone straight down and into the water and potentially getting hurt. So um, you can kind of see where we're putting fill in to flatten that slope out so that it's not so steep so that if someone were to go off the edge, you know, they have a chance of slowing down and, and getting um, and stopping, not making it to the water. So this is um, 
the high wall here. Um, the other picture is showing on the right is showing um, where once we're done, we're gonna create a wetland in this basin. So um, because we were removing some waterways, uh, we try to put them back and put wetland plants in to make it more um, environmentally friendly. Um, and this is one of our emergency projects. Again, it's a pit subsidence. We see a lot of these uh, throughout the state, a lot down in Decoin and all the way up to Streeter. Um, somehow the ground is shifting where the underground mining has, has occurred and uh, the ground will slough off. Um, so as you can see, you know, we're just doing one pit here. Uh, we excavated it to stable soil. We put some fill in and then there's our flowable fill going in. And we can do this relatively cheaply. We try to get out and get it filled uh, if it's, you know, going to impact humans. You know, so if it's in an area where the kids are walking by or, you know, a community park, somewhere that it's, it's got a high probability of having, you know, humans fall into this pit, we'll get out and get it done, you know, try to get it done in two to four weeks. And, and you can see the reclamation cost of only $8,000 to get this done. So those were just uh, some of our projects that we're working on to give you an idea of what type of activities we will reclaim from abandoned mines. Um, I, uh, this, this is telling you the status of our program. We have three priorities, one, two, and three, and I'll talk about those in a minute. We have unfunded. So this is the work that has not been completed, that we know there are problems out there and they're in our, in our uh, database, the AMLIS so that we know that we need to get out these and fix these and then we'll prioritize them to figure out what we're working on in any given year. Uh, the funded category is problems that we are reclaiming right now. So we've got about 25 million in some form of reclamation. You know, we've got some projects that we're just getting ready to close out. Uh, one of the things we like to do is make sure that the grass is growing so we leave the projects open so that we can come in and fertilize in the spring and make sure we're getting a good ground cover to minimize erosion. Um, so we've got about 25 million active construction getting ready to close out. Um, complete it through the life of the program. So since about 1983, we've spent about $433 million reclaiming projects. Um, this RPA is a government reporting something or other. And uh, so it's equivalent. We try to, um, you know, not all projects, like when you're looking at a portal or a vertical opening are, are kind of hard to put into acres. So we have equations that we use to do equivalent acres. And so uh, we've reclaimed about 35,000 acres uh, throughout all the projects through the program since its inception. So I talked about priorities one, two, and three. Uh, when we put something in the inventory, when we identify a problem, we have to classify it as priority one, two, or three. And so uh, obviously we're gonna look at priority one projects because they are uh, projects that we deem having an extreme danger from adverse impacts of the coal mining. Um, so whether they're in a high traffic area, whether, you know, it's an opening and someone would not be able to get out on their own, things like that, extreme danger. So we're going to protect public health and safety and property from these extreme dangers. Priority two are important projects, but they're not extreme. We call those just adverse impacts. So um, in our priority, we can work on priority in our program. We can work on priority one and two projects. And if we find a priority three that's in the vicinity of a priority one or two, you know, in, a, in, in the same mine site, then we can go ahead and do priority three. But we really focus on priority one and two projects. Uh, priority three is the restoration of land and water. So environmental degradation. Um, I just wanted to give you an idea of all the different types of projects we have. We have 
And, and remember, you know, when you were looking at those slides, it usually isn't just one type of pro problem on the site. You know, we could have high wall and bad water, we could have slurry and high wall, you know, there's, there's usually a, a variety of problems on one side. So we have a total of 564 projects in our inventory that are priority one that we want to reclaim and that are in our inventory. And so we have to prioritize those projects to figure out what we wanna do. Um, I think we talked about a lot of these clogged streams, dangerous high walls is one of our, our most common problems. As you see from the pictures, we got dangerous impoundments, dangerous piles and embankments. Uh, gob was also mine waste, think of that as mine waste. Um, high wall, mine openings, portals, vertical openings are some of our big ones. So um, what I'm showing you today is straight out of our admin rules. So uh, of course, Illinois, we were legislated uh, by Illinois legislature years and years ago to, to run the AML program. And so when we put the rules together, um, these were the order that they wanted us to look at um, setting our priorities for abandoned mine reclamation. So these are my rules, um, not to say that there isn't wiggle room, but these, these were the order that they wanted me to do. So surface openings, um, portals, vertical openings, we feel are the, a very high priority uh, if someone can get in there and not get out and get hurt. Um, and then we have gas, mine gases, mine fires, hazardous equipment. We don't want someone getting hurt on equipment left over from the mining. And then we go to impoundments, high walls, and I'll let you read through the rest of the list. So by law, we are uh, required to prioritize even once the priority one and twos based on um, by our regulations. And then, but they also let us look at, uh, look at each site individually. So if we leave it unreclaimed, is there uh, gonna be continued high impacts? Um, is it close to a populated area or uh, do we see, you know, recreation sites? Are we seeing a lot of people on four wheelers or just walking by, things like that. And one of the other uh, that I tried to, um, let you know is we also have to have a, land, a willing landowner. Most of these projects are done on private property. And so it could be the worst vertical opening, but if they don't want us on the property, then we're not gonna fix it. Okay, so how do you know if the problem area in your community is part of our program? There is an Illinois mine permit map. Um, if you go to IDNR's website, it's under the Office of Mines and Minerals. I would recommend searching for Illinois mine permit maps. Um, the URL for the website is, it makes no sense. It's numbers, letters, nothing that's, you know, something that you can keep. So I would just really search for Illinois mine, mine maps. So when you go and pull the map up, you're gonna see all, it's gonna have these red, red areas in. And those red areas are our permitted areas. So not a part of the AML program, part of our regulatory side. Uh, the map was set up with them in mind, but we have our stuff there too. So going back. So if you look, the layers list looks like a sheet of paper, sheets of paper stacked on one. That's, that's what we call the layer list. And if you open that up, uh, what you're gonna see is the permit boundaries and the permitted areas. Those are the red areas. But if you scroll down the list, you're gonna find near the bottom AML project sites. If you click on that, that'll bring up the locations of all the areas that we have identified that need to be reclaimed. But it also includes areas that we have already, rec have already done the reclamation on, so. So if you go and click the checkbox for abandoned mine line sites, then you're gonna get some yellow, yellow areas. I've gone and zoomed in into a couple of counties here. Um, sorry, I have, even I can't change the colors. So you wanna pick a base map, um, the four squares over here, you wanna pick a base map to let you show up. 
to uh, show to, to highlight the yellow, you know, against either, you know, because the base map, when you pull it up, will be just a regular street map. And so the yellow kind of gets hard to see unless you zoom in. If you go and click on that site, it'll let you know our inventory. We call it our pad, our problem area description. It'll let you know what, what uh, problem area it is, who the mining company was. Um, and if this project ID says zero, the chances are, I'm not gonna guarantee you, but the chances are pretty good that we have not reclaimed this area yet. Um, if it has a number in there, then we have, uh, we have done some construction. Now, remember a lot of these sites have different problems types on there and we may not get to all of them at the same time. So just, you know, so if you were going to give us a call and ask us about a particular property, you know, you could, you could give us the address and we'll look it up. But this is, um, this is one of the areas we go to to identify the projects. Now, we have not identified all the problem areas. We, uh, we, when people call us, we'll go out and investigate. We'll, uh, if we're out in the area looking at other things, we may find uh, sites that need reclaimed adjacent to one of the project areas that we're working on. So one of the other layers that you can turn on is this inactive underground mine area. So um, this will give you an idea whether there was underground mining activities in your area of interest. So just because we haven't identified a problem there doesn't mean that it's not eligible. Okay, I'm almost done here. Current program. Um, our current program, we do our construction, our reclamation projects. Um, the majority of these are coal reclamations. In our, uh, in our legislation, we are allowed to spend 2% of our funding, our grant funding that we receive any year on non-coal mineral restoration. So we have done some lead and zinc restoration areas. We have done some florist bar, um, but, but this does not include aggregate. So we can't go in and reclaim an aggregate quarry. These are for minerals. We also have the emergency projects and acid mine drainage projects. Um, emergency projects, uh, two of my favorites here. Um, they occur very suddenly. Uh, this is an aggregate quarry and uh, they were gone for the holidays. You see, you know, these things like to happen in the holidays. So I can't remember if it was Christmas or New Year's, they came back to work. And this hole is an actual mine shaft and it opened up to, I've heard 400, 600 feet. Um, so it was a very deep mine shaft that had to be filled up. So they are life-threatening, require immediate reclamation. Um, our most common problems are pit subsidence and shaft openings. Um, this lower picture is actually a middle school and it had a subsidence, a large subsidence event. So it wasn't just a little, little pit opening that we opened, it was, it was significantly over most of the school site. Um, and they saw drops in the area of about uh, six to 18 inches. So here you can see that the floor has buckled, it has dropped. Um, so when the kids came back to school that day, um, a very dangerous situation. So uh, um, a threat to life, to safety, and occurred suddenly, no warning, you know, uh, just extreme, extreme openings. Lastly, we have our acid mine drainage. Um, so these are low pH waters. Usually they're from the drainage from mine refuse, picking up the minerals, reducing the pH. Um, we have two types of systems we can do. We can do a passive system, which is what I'm showing in the upper picture. Um, and it needs occasional maintenance. So we'll have to come in and change the median that's um, absorbing these minerals to um, release the clean water. So we'll go in you know, every five, 10 years and uh, clean it out and, and restart the median that's um, absorbing the, the minerals. Um, otherwise it's an active treatment plant. And so it's gonna need someone to commit to operate. Um, so, we, did, we haven't done our, our acid mine drainage program as we're trying to get it started. We do have this one site that we're doing, um, but 
we're going to need assistance if we're going to do some active treatment. We're going to need someone locally. So something I want you to keep in mind from this today. And, um, and this bottom picture is the fact that uh, the water was clean. Once it leaves this uh, passive treatment system and down to the receiving stream, it is clean, it is high pH uh, or nat neutral pH so that it's good for the environment. And that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. And we've got Eric Dixon up next. So he's got some slides to share as well. Hey, everybody, can you see me? Yep, looks good. Great. Um, so I just want to start off by thanking the University of Illinois Extension Office, uh, the Just Transition Fund, and Prairie Rivers Network for, for having me today. Um, I'm actually based in Kentucky. I'm not in, El in Illinois, but uh, AML is something that I'm very interested in. And um, we released a report on the program a few months ago. Um, so I'm going to be sharing some of our findings from that report, both nationally and um, specifically looking at Illinois. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides now. Okay. So I'm going to assume you can see those. I won't be able to see the chat as I'm going through this, um, but definitely happy to take questions at the end. Um, so my name is Eric Dixon. I am at Ohio River Valley Institute. Um, and like I said, I'm based out of Kentucky and our organization is you know, based regionally in the Ohio River Valley. Um, I'm going to talk through the where, who, how much, and how many as it relates to AML. I'm hoping that this can be a good complement to Rita's presentation. Rita is really the expert, you know, the leader on this program uh, in the state. Um, so I'm going to try to complement that without um, replicating too much of it. And, you know, she showed some maps looking specifically at Illinois, but this gives you a sense of the national geographic distribution of uh, the AML problem across the country. You can see obviously large um, concentrations in, in the Appalachian region um, and in Illinois and Indiana, and then also kind of a, 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 along the Rockies that was a little bit more distributed, but it is a national problem. This um, gives you a sense of the distribution of AML problems across the country by a couple different different metrics. One is kind of unreclaimed acres. And that's a standardized unit that, that Rita mentioned, GPRA, and we can talk about that more if you'd like. Um, and then also an estimate of the distribution by, by cost. Um, and I've highlighted Illinois there. You can see it's about halfway um, it's like kind of in the middle of the pack in terms of all the, the states and tribes with AML problems. And one, thing's to, one thing to note about these figures is that they're, they're based on a federal inventory that is, is incomplete in many ways and unstandardized across states in many ways. So I kind of, and I think many officials kind of look at the, the state or the, the inventory data as like um, a baseline figure. Like we know that the size of the problem isn't lower than what's in, in the inventory, but it's probably much larger and it's difficult to know, to compare states and tribes to one another um, with the kind of existing state of the inventory, but it's, it's what we have. This gives you a sense of uh, something that Rita already touched on a little bit, which is the top kind of common problem types in a few different states. In Illinois, there's, you know, some of the, top problems, water problems, dangerous high walls. And, and Rita talked a lot about, um, you know, specific examples of those projects that, that are being worked on or have been worked on in the state already. So I want to kind of give a sense of um, who, the kind of network of people who are impacted by um, AMLs and who potentially benefit from AML reclamation. Um, the, the kind of broadest group is, you know, the public, the people in non-human life in the community or in the surrounding watershed or ecosystem that are affected 
by these, you know, this environmental degradation. Um, and specifically, the property owners um, of the land or, you know, adjacent water that's damaged by these AMLs. So those are two, you know, important stakeholders. Um, and then a couple of groups that we haven't talked about as much yet, but are, are really important for AML cleanup are the workers who actually clean up this uh, damaged land and water. Um, and many of those are hourly, you know, construction worker, construction workers um, at private contractors. Um, but also many of them are salaried workers who work with those contractors or who work um, in the state or federal government on AML reclamation. And the way the process works is, um, at least in, in general terms, um, the, the state agency will, will kind of engineer the reclamation project. We'll, you know, it'll select the problem to clean up. It'll engineer the reclamation project, and then it will bid out the reclamation uh, of that site through uh, construction contractors um, and according to state regulations, which, which can vary pretty widely by state. And then um, I, I already alluded to this, but the third kind of big stakeholder here is, is the government, and that's you know, staff at both the federal and the state and tribal level. There are a number of different occupations and trades that are necessary for successful reclamation of AML problems. And I wanted to just list out some of those because I think it can be uh, kind of interesting to dig into them. So, you know, you need surveyors, ge geologists, biologists, engineers, you need a lot of kind of um, scientific and engineering expertise to design these reclamation projects well. And I think that's kind of an under talked about piece of AML reclamation. Um, and then there's also hourly, hourly workers at the construction contractors. And these can be a variety of specific trades and in Illinois are generally grouped in kind of three big common categories for AML reclamation. Those being laborers, operating engineers of various you know, specific trades and truck drivers. And I wanted to give a sense of what the minimum wage levels are uh, per state law in, in Illinois. This isn't the case with all of the states, but the state of Illinois has a prevailing minimum wage law that applies to AML contracts. And I wanted to give a sense of the, the wage rates in, these are the top three counties that have uh, AML problems in Illinois. And um, you can see here, um, at least as someone who studies, you know, these trades in the Appalachian region, these are fairly high wage rates. Um, so you can see the lowest here is about $26 an hour and the highest about $55 an hour. And that's a range. Um, I, the range being the lowest paid laborer or operating engineer I could find in the prevailing wage rate scales, which are published every few months by the state of Illinois and the highest there being like the highest paid operating engineer class. So there's a range of, uh, of these wages hourly, but they, um, they, they're pretty high, at least relative to other states. I also wanted to compare those wage rates to um, the poverty level and living wage level. Um, and this is Illinois specific data. And you can see that that 26 to 54 an hour wage rate range is, is higher than both the poverty and living wage level. And that, that living wage level assumes a family of four with both adults working. So if you were to change those assumptions, you know, that rate's gonna be a little different, but uh, with those assumptions, it's even the lowest paid AML construction workers making more than a living wage in, in Illinois. So from that perspective, you know, these are, these are good jobs in, in rural areas. I'm gonna move kind of quickly through the national level piece. Um, this is just to make the point that we've had this program, this federal program for 40 years, and we've really only reclaimed about a quarter of the overall size of the problem. Um, 
And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, those costs with this slide. So if you just look at the red uh, bar first, that is how much it will cost to reclaim all of the AML problems across the country. The darkest part of the red bar is what's in the federal inventory that I mentioned earlier. But as I mentioned, that inventory is incomplete for a, a number of reasons that you know, AML officials you know, widely agree on. And so in our report, we made some adjustments based on those kind of deficiencies. And our estimates or projections are you know, the rest of that bar. So you can see you're looking at about 25 or $26 billion worth of uh, AML that we still need to clean up across the country. Now the green bar, is how much um, is in the bipartisan infrastructure bill at present. So this isn't in law yet. This is just the proposal that's before Congress. Um, and it includes two different things. It includes um, an extension of AML fee collection, which you know expired at the end of September. It, it includes a 13 year extension of that at lower, those fee levels are a little bit lower than the current rates, which is, which is frankly pretty disappointing. But nonetheless, this includes a projection of the revenue that will be collected from those fees um, for the next 15 years and the $11.3 billion appropriation that's included in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which really, if, is, if that's put into law, is a historic um, investment in AML cleanup that we really have never seen in the, in the program's 40 year history up to this point. So, um, this would get us a lot closer um, than we've ever been to cleaning up the side, uh, you know, the remaining AML problem across the country. And that's a big, big deal. Um, and I also think we should keep it in perspective that even with this huge allotment, if it becomes law, we'll still have a massive, you know, more than $10 billion worth of these problems across the country. Um, and finally, I want to just give some basic jobs uh, estimates for AML reclamation. Um, I can talk about the assumptions behind these and the questions if you'd like, but the main point that you should take at this, I, I'll, I'll share my slides and you can dig more into this if you'd like, it's also in the report. Um, but the main point you should take from this is that um, if we were to pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill, we would create about 4,000 uh, direct AML jobs um, across the country. And in addition to those direct jobs, um, which you can see on the left here under national, the direct jobs, that's just the figure, the medium scenario estimate I took from the last slide. In addition to those direct jobs, there's also the, the jobs kind of along the supply chain and from the spending, effect, uh, spending effects in the community and region where AML reclamation happens, you know, that supports jobs too. And that would create about 11,000 jobs per year for 15 years, um, that's nationally. And if you look at Illinois in, particu in particular, um, based on the way the bill is drawn up at present, Illinois would get about 10%, maybe a little bit less, but about 10% of those jobs, both direct and indirect and induced jobs. Um, and that, by the way, assumes the higher end of the wage rate that I looked at earlier. So this assumes $100 an hour in gross pay. So not just wages, but gross pay that includes pension and benefits. Um, so again, those are, those are very good jobs. Um, and it, and yeah, this assumes about 10% of the total funding goes to Illinois. Um, so there are things to, to critique about the, the AML part of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, it definitely doesn't have all of the things that I would like to see in it or that our report calls for. Um, but it, it's, it could be a massive investment and really uh, impact some of the rural communities in states like Illinois that have lost and will continue to lose coal jobs in the future. Um, so I'll just um, note that, you know, in the report and in my slides that I'll share, um, I have some recommendations about how the language could be improved and how it could be connected to a uh, citizens climate core. 
Um, but I won't go into those details now. Um, I'll leave those for the questions or for digging into the report and I will hand it back over to Amanda. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I'm actually gonna let Dana um, share a little bit about where these um, federal infrastructure packages and other proposals in Congress are right now. It's all a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> Hi, I'm Dana Kinline. I am now nowadays based in Cincinnati, but I actually grew up uh, about halfway between Jerseyville and Fielden and Jersey County, Illinois, and I don't always get to talk to Illinois audiences, so this is fun for me. Um, so I work nationally on energy and abandoned mine lands issues, and I do follow Unfortunately for me, I follow Congress closely. So a quick update, I know we're tied on time. Um, you all may remember that the Senate passed what was known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill or Framework or BIF or BIP um, back in early August, which seems like a lifetime ago. And that included this language that Eric was referring to for the $11.3 billion um, as well as reauthorization of the abandoned mine land fee. And so, you know, I, I, I think it's been said, but just to say, you know, in the past uh, decades of the program, I think about six to $8 billion has been spent on abandoned mine land cleanup. And so the influx of an additional 11 billion would really be a game changer for what's possible. Um, some of the things that Rita talked about, um, you know, the, all the requirements that are needed, all, all the incredible work that's happening, we could expand that and do even more. Um, and hits, and, and, I, and I would like to see us hit some of these lower priority sites that aren't in active danger, but maybe are an impediment to economic development or, you know, so, that, so it could allow for a new expansion. So, but what's happening with it? That's what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> Obviously, I'm excited. Um, so, the, so after the Senate passes the bill, um, you know, we all watched the, the little um, video on Saturday morning cartoons. It was a lie. But in theory, after uh, the Senate passes a the bill, then the House can pass it and then it goes to the, the president's desk. But what's happening is um, the House is seeing this bill um, as a companion bill to another larger package um, known as the Build Back Better or Reconciliation. And so it's in a holding pattern while we wait to see um, what the House and the Senate are going to negotiate for the second package of um, investments known as the Build Back Better Act. Um, those do actually have some or a lot of pieces in them that would be interesting to communities that are looking at economic diversification um, following the downturn of the coal industry, if you're experiencing that in your community, but it is a, a separate piece. Another thing that would be included in that second bill, the Build Back Better, is also is an extension of the Black Lung Excise Tax, which is important for coal miners who um, have gotten black lung. So we see that as, you know, when we think about economic transition and what's next for communities that have had a history of coal, obviously making sure we're taking care of workers and worker transition funds um, if, if folks are losing their jobs are included. And so, so those two pieces are actually in that Build Back Better bill. So there is a lot in there that's interesting to us, but, um, but the infrastructure bill, and we do see these abandoned mine lands as an infrastructure issue, um, did pass the Senate. We hope it'll pass the House. Um, we don't know exactly when, but it is definitely a great time if you are interested in these issues, um, definitely uh, to reach out to Congress and make sure they, they know you're paying attention because they are a little bit <laughs> niche and smaller, um, but they, they really have an impact. And the type of money we're talking about could really be a game changer, especially for communities in Illinois that um, have such a history of, of AML and maybe a lot of these smaller sites that are a detriment, but, but they're not high enough priority to get on the list, um, this would allow us to get to some of those. Um, and then uh, the, um, the last thing I'll say is it's also a very frustrating time. <laughs> like we're ex so excited about what's possible, but what we're dealing with at the same time is at this point, we don't know. Um, if we're going to have zero dollars in 2022 for abandoned mine lands because they haven't reauthorized the basic funding mechanism for the program, or if we're going to have 11 billion. So it's a really difficult place. 
um, for advocates and agencies who are doing this work and for contractors who are doing this work and for people who live near it and want the work done, we're in a really awkward holding pattern, but I am really hopeful that um, um, we'll get it over the finish line. Um, so I, I think that's what I'll say. I mean, um, and if folks have any questions about those specifics, I'll um, let you know. And the last thing I'll make a pitch for is, um, uh, Rita talked about the acid mine drainage issue, and we have a new acid mine drainage series. I'll drop a link for that in the chat to talk a little bit more about how acid mine drainage fits into it all. So. Thank you so much, Dana, and definitely encourage folks to check out the information she's sharing in the chat. Some great work has been done in the Appalachian region, and I hope after today, a lot of us will engage on this issue in Illinois together a bit more. We have one more presentation from Karen Peterson with the Nature Conservancy, um, who's gonna talk about a program that they're bringing to Illinois and just kicking off. So it's just a couple minutes. Please keep putting questions in the chat. We'll answer them in the chat. And we'll also stay on a little past noon for folks that wanna stay on and ask more questions. So Karen. Hi everyone. Yeah, I will, I promise to be brief. I know we're at time. Um, I am just going to talk briefly about a an initiative that TNC Nature Conservancy is just starting here in Illinois, which is a potential opportunity to use some of the reclaimed abandoned mine sites um, in Illinois and in other states as well. Um, I lead climate change work for the Illinois chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And I'm grateful to have this opportunity to talk about this new work that we're starting up. Uh, we are building off work that's already been done in Nevada and West Virginia, where they have a large um, mining presence and they have worked to incentivize renewable energy development on abandoned mine lands. Um, and we are seeking to increase the development of renewable energy here on degraded lands in Illinois as well, including abandoned mine lands, but also other brownfields like landfills. So just for some Background quickly, uh, in general, we know that large scale wind and solar deployment is key to greening the US economy and averting the worst impacts of climate change. Um, however, we also know that meeting our country's clean energy needs will have uh, a large land footprint. It will require uh, millions of acres of land to meet the amount of renewable energy required. And by some estimates, um, that infrastructure could have a footprint as large as the states of uh, Colorado and Wyoming combined. And that level of development really does create the potential for conflicts with local communities um, and has the potential to also negatively impact natural areas and critical habitat, as well as slowing down progress towards this essential transition to renewable energy. So, we have found that by incentivizing renewable energy build out on previously disturbed sites, uh, we can direct um, that development away from areas that are high conflict for communities um, and nature, avoid delays and accelerate deployment, which can create a win-win situation. However, we also know it can be more challenging to, um, to incentive or to actually get the renewable energy build out on degraded sites because of some of the challenges, as Rita was explaining, um, just with reclaiming those sites and some of the challenges that developers might face. And um, so we still need to develop a better understanding of some of what those major barriers are for renewable energy development here in the state. And so what we are doing um, over the course of this year is really the first phase of this work. And we will be working on two key things. One is developing an interactive mapping tool. And for those of you who know about US EPA's work on repowering America's lands, it's essentially building off of that map, which has a map of degraded lands, um, abandoned mines and other brownfields. Um, and we're going to add to that by layering on renewable energy potential so that we have a much better understanding of the potential opportunity for um, encouraging renewable energy build out on degraded land in the state. And then second, we need to analyze the policy barriers that currently exist um, and, and work to overcome those barriers. So we really need to understand where that, um, where we can make tweaks to help incentivize this development. And for that work, we really will be working with stakeholders um, either through workshops, listening sessions, interviews. Um, and we expect to complete this by really within the next year. And um, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, as we start this work, we really are interested in talking with anybody who 
has information about this, might be an interested stakeholder um, or knows who we should be talking to. And so please do reach out to me. Um, here, I'll just put, pop up my contact information again. Please do reach out to me if you have any insights or ideas for key people to interview or involve in this work. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Amanda. Um, thank you. Thank you, Karen. And as folks have hopefully heard, Illinois just passed a new energy bill, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, that's going to drastically boost renewable, renewable development in the state. So I know I'm excited about joining the Nature Conservancy's efforts to ensure that the policies we have now and future policies um, prioritize development on brown fields and abandoned mine lands and other similar types. So with that, that concludes our presentations. Um, I think we've done a good job of answering a lot of your questions in the chat. I know Lisa has been monitoring that as we've gone. So please add more questions if you have them and I'll let Lisa ask any that maybe we haven't gotten to. One question that I saw that we haven't heard, uh, or I don't think you responded to, is, and this was during Rita's presentation, um, is there a web link to specifications for cleanup practices, and are there third-party project supervisors, uh, such as experienced engineering firms, to help? I cannot think of any uh, website or uh, other design information available for someone to look at um, for reclamation design. Um, we do a lot of the work in-house. There probably are some firms out there that could help with uh, reclamation design, but we pretty much do it in-house. Okay, thanks very much. Um, and one other question that I, I'm not sure we covered, although correct me if I'm wrong, is are there abandoned uh, room and pillar mines that require filling with something to prevent collapse and subsidence? Brent, are you out there? Do you want to take this one? Yes, I am here. Um, yeah, I mean, um, there, that's definitely an option on abandoned room and pillar mines. Uh, we don't do a lot of that um, proactively as an AML program. We're more reactive. Um, we have done um, over the years, I can think of um, three uh, particular projects that were emergency projects to address um, SAG type mine subsidence over room and pillar mines. Uh, and those, those were backfilled because they were very high priority, um, dangerous emergency projects. So one was a, a bridge um, east of Springfield on Interstate um, 72. Um, we did a um, highway uh, near Belleville, uh, Illinois Route 15. Uh, that was actually a pit subsidence. And then the latest was the Wolf Branch Middle School. Uh, project uh, where uh, the school was built, a uh, portion of the school was built over a abandoned room and pillar mine, and that was then um, backfilled so they could rebuild a portion of the school. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, next question to come in is, do you have an inventory of all of the active and disused mines in Illinois? Um, we definitely have inventory of active mines um, that that is not done under the abandoned mine program that's done elsewhere in the office of mines and minerals. Um, we do have some inventory uh, when the program started, they kind of went through and looked at uh, where uh, mining had occurred in the past. Um, we do have a program where we're trying to digitize where we know where we have mine maps to show where some of this mine mining has occurred. I'm not going to tell you that it's inclusive of everything, but we do have some inventories. Excellent. Thank you. And the last question I see in the chat, um, Nancy, this one might be for you. Um, it's a discussion of all of the useful links and everything that was in the chat. And will those links and comments be available with the slide decks in a follow up email? Absolutely. I am um, going to uh, collate all of those useful resource links to everyone um, and include a, a folder where they can view 
and um, access the slide decks, PDFs of the slides, as well as the recording. Um, and that should be coming out um, this afternoon. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and Ted just slid one more question in. Um, the first part of it is who generally owns abandoned mine lands and at what point might private ownership uh, be lost if the property by some sort of due process is deemed to be hazardous to neighbors um, without some kind of remediation? Generally, most of the property that we work on is private property. Um, you know, we saw samples of uh, state park. Um, we talked about some of the high, Brett talked about some of the highway bridges or areas that, um, but for the most part, most of the land that we work on is in private ownership. Um, we have never done anything to condemn property or purchase property. We typically look for willing owners. Um, thankfully, we haven't come across a situation where um, it is detrimental to everyone around. Um, so I'm not sure what we would do in that situation. All right, thank you very much. I think that concludes the questions we have in our, our um, comments and chat. Um, Amanda, do you wanna say a few words to close us out? Um, yeah, just thanks to everybody um, for joining. I know we had a lot of folks re register that work on this issue, either with the state geological survey or water survey or um, OSMRE um, and other nonprofits and community act advocates. So I would just encourage folks to reach out to myself, to our presenters, and let's talk about next steps to, to support this um, program in Illinois. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.